Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for this live stream event. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the event planner of Microsoft Reactor New York. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review two items, our code of conduct and the event guidelines. So for our code of conduct, Microsoft Reactor seeks to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but please be mindful with your commentary to remain professional and on topic. For our event guidelines, this session will be recorded. You will not be appearing in the video. If you have questions or comments, please submit them into the Q&A chat on the top right of your screen, and we'll have a Q&A session later on in, um, in this uh, window of time. Closed captioning is available. To turn it on, um, you'll find CC or live captioning icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. It should be available in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. The agenda for today is a brief welcome. We'll start off with We Ventures, go over to IFC, and then uh, wrap up with a Q&A. Which brings us to today's session. Uh, today we'll be covering how to bring diversity at the startup level. This event is part of a series of workshops promoted in partnership by IFC and Microsoft with the support of We Ventures and We Impact and with the objective of fostering women entrepreneurship. Our guests will walk you through their presentations and then we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A session at the end. Which brings us to our speakers. So please welcome Stephanie Vox Stevens, an investment officer and global gender lead from IFC, Josie Middleton, a ScaleX program lead and global gender lead at IFC, and then finally welcome back Marcella Siva, a chief investment officer from We Ventures. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you coming on and giving us your time. And without further ado, we will welcome Marcella to get started. Hi everyone, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for being here with us. Let me try to start sharing my screen. Please let me know if it's working. Rebecca, is my screen okay? Can you see it? It looks great. Thank you so much. Good. All right. <laughs> um, so I am Marcella. I'm the Chief Investment Officers, Officer at We Ventures. Um, we are the first fund in Latin America to be 100% dedicated to investing in women in technology. Proudly so. Um, I'll try to start off. I'll make a very brief introductory um, speech on how to push diversity into your startup based on the seven um, women empowerment principles. And then I'll just hand over to the experts. We're sure that the IFC has a lot more content to share. Um, a brief snapshot of the, the, the ecosystem and how it works. There's, the numbers are very sad, right? Only 2% of global venture capital dollars go to female um, founded businesses. Um, women are proportionally more unemployed than men. Um, there's a huge pay gap, right, of 270% um, between women and men, men earning more than women on average. Um, institutionalized racism still keeps black women from entering the former wor workforce. This, all of this reflects on the, the status of um, women in the society today. And it's not any different in technology. I always like to bring data. So in Brazil, we have only 20% of women in STEM careers, according to our government census. And that's around the average worldwide, where it's always about 19%, 20% um, across the globe. And there is nothing biological that justifies this. The UN also has um, a very nice study that mentioned that there are no biological reasons for women not entering STEM careers. Um, so women are not biologically unable to perform math. Um, that's not the case. It's just a very cultural to just traditional thing brought on um, throughout um, the centuries. And there's actually in this that study, they say that girls in school are actually more likely to enter into STEM careers if they have women um, math teachers. So it's just a matter of of um, example now of of being there and and showing women that 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 we are able to um, be in STEM. 
still, in spite of all this, um, women founded companies are more lucrative. They have quicker exits. Um, they perform better. They have higher returns. So there is no reason why we should do so little for women across the globe. Um, this material, as I said, is based on the seven women empowerment principles. These principles were put together by, were, were developed by the UN Global Compact and UN Women. And then this playbook of how to push this kind of diversity into your startup was put together by We Impact. You can find this complete material in weimpact.tech. They are our venture building um, house. They prepare really early stage companies for investment by We Ventures. So I'm going to try um, to briefly go over these principles with you and just, you know, um, this material will be available online after our session for consultation, so I'm not going to go through every bullet, but please do feel free to reach out to us and ask for the material and inquire where it is. Um, these are the seven principles and the most important of all is start now. So little is done for women across the globe that anything we start doing at any point already makes such a huge difference. So start now at any stage of your company. The first principle is um, establishing a pro-female empowerment leadership. And then for each principle, we have put together what to do in each stage of your company. So in ideation, oops, my screen stopped sharing. Can you still see it? Well, I got it back. Um, so for each um, stage, what to do in ideation, what to do in validation, what to do in growth and scale. Um, and again, this will be available on our link so you can consult us later. I'm not going to go through all the bullets, but just um, in general to apply principle number one, this should be gender should be a strategic priority. It should start, unfortunately and fortunately, from the top. So this the diversity of your founders should always be um, first and foremost, very important, and then the diversity of your board, and then the diversity of your uh, leadership levels. So always concentrating on making this a strategic priority, if not for any other reason, because it generates more returns. More diverse companies, um, companies with more diverse boards, have better returns overall. This has, has been proven already across um, many different um, um, research. Principle number two, treat all men and women fairly, respect and support human rights and anti-discrimination policies. Again, we have the bullets for each stage and feel free to come here later to consult on the bullets, but in general, let's strive to avoid microaggressions that reinforce intersectional discrimination, right? So we should recognize that we have different groups have different needs. We should be open and having a very strong anti-discrimination culture. And this always starts again um, from the leadership. You need to set the example. You need to listen to your employees. You need to understand and be welcoming to their needs. Um, establishing policies of financial equality, for example, between men, women, and between all levels of diversity. Um, products that are gender inclusive. There's so much that you can do that doesn't necessarily mean um, investing more money. And that's very essential. Principle number three, guaranteeing the health, safety, and well-being of all employees. Again, I think the key word here is listening. Of course, we should um, value and address the health and the safety of all our employees, but mostly being open to listening to everyone's needs. So creating a welcoming environment, creating a well, uh, an environment in which everybody can speak up about their needs. Jesus, I stopped sharing again. You see my screen? Yeah, okay. it's not it's not going down for us. We oh, keep no? seeing it, but. Oh, it goes down for me. OK, um, better. Um, so having this um, speak up culture in which everyone feels safe and feels heard. And again, if not for any other reason, for the reason that it does um, make up for the, the multiple points of view in your team will make up for a better product, a, be a better product market fit. So 
having flexible work schedules, um, thinking about the benefits that you can offer to your team, really paying attention to their needs and listening to what they need and understanding that different people of different backgrounds have different needs and that you should be able to meet all of them. That's that's pretty much it. Um, principle number four, promoting education, training and professional development for women. And here I, I like to go a little bit further. I think that knowledge and education are very powerful tools and removing cultural barriers to gender equality. That's definitely it. But more than that, I think, and I can say that as a white heterosexual woman, we are all lacking knowledge, knowledge of about gender, about um, respect. I, I was just watching the Olympi Olympics these days and the commentators did not know how to address a non-binary person. Um, so we should study, we should be more knowledgeable about how they feel, how they want to be addressed, um, how do they fit in, uh, how do we create an environment um, to welcome all kinds of people, all kinds of diversity. And that also translates into educating women, bringing women into um, the formal workforce and making um, intentional effort to, to create gender training in your company and should try to be um, as welcoming and as professional and including policies um, towards that as possible. Principle number five, supporting female entrepreneurship and promoting female empowerment through supply chains and marketing. Um, we all love female entrepreneurship here, don't we? Um, that's what we do daily. We do support that, but I think we could go a little bit further and intentionally look for suppliers and for um, players in your chain that are diverse, not necessarily um, female led, but diverse. I'm sure that it's easier and faster to go for the largest suppliers, but in, in that translates into all sorts of hiring and subcontracting, right? I'm sure that it's easier to go um, to the more famous ones, the well-known ones, but I'm positive that there are more diverse alternatives that we can um, rely on and that are definitely um, of the same quality or even better. So we should, as women and anywhere, just trying to be more diverse, we should try to make this effort to look for diversity in our ecosystem, in our hirings, in our contractors and subcontractors. Principle number six, promoting gender equality through activism and community in initiatives. That's something I always say. When I speak about our cause, um, if we are not vocal and active about our cause, we can't expect anybody else to be. So women have to be vocal about their causes. We need to be active. We need to be vocal. We need to be engaged with the community, with our families, with our companies. It starts at home and we, we bring this out into the world. Definitely. So companies um, and leaderships should always be aware how of how can we promote an, a safer environment, a more welcoming environment in this case for women, but in all cases for, for diversity. Um, we see um, across the globe, um, women, em um, women employment rates plummeting around the 30s because sadly, women still have to choose between their careers and having kids around the world. And this shouldn't be so. Right. Women should be able to um, have both, right? Be able to work and have kids and stay in the workforce. So how can we retain those women? How can we make it easier for them to be um, before, during and after pregnancy? How can we create policies and public policies and engaging with policymakers, not only inside our companies, but with the governments as well? How can we create a better environment for for hiring and retaining women and making it so that they don't have to leave the workforce to have kids. And last but not least, measuring, documenting and publishing your prog progress towards reaching gender equality. This is actually a very important item in global ESG investing standards. That's the way um, we're able to monitor how companies are evolving in this sense, right? So. 
do not be afraid of registering your progress and do not forget to do so and publish it as much as possible because it does make your company more attractive. Um, there's also research from Stanford that shows that they monitored a bunch of financial companies and a bunch of technology companies, like the largest ones, um, and their share prices along years, like for five to eight years, if I'm not sure, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. And they noticed that every time each of these companies made a disclosure, a formal disclosure regarding diverse, positive diversity numbers, the share price increased. And mostly all of, of all other disclosures did not affect share price. So again, if for no other reason, because it does increase the value of your company being more diverse in the eyes of the market. Um, yeah, and before thanking you, just um, try to notice that most of what we covered here does not involve active investment. So there is a lot you can do. As I said, so little is done for women today that there is anything you can do, um, anything you do will already create a huge change and not necessarily need a lot of investment. So start anywhere, start now at any stage, and I'm sure the change it will bring about will be very powerful. Thank you. I will hand you over now to, I'm not sure okay. if it's Steph or, or, or Josie. It's me, thank you, Marcella. Uh, just wait for the slides to come up. Okay. Thank you so much, Josie. It's always good to have you for life. Tech. <laughs> so, um, is there a way to put up the full? Oh, yes. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. It's it's great to be here. Thank you, Marcella, for that awesome uh, kickoff. And and you hit it right there, saying it's time to start now. Um, and and at the IFC, it, it's definitely what we've been doing for some time. But we always encourage our early stage um, ecosystem participants to kick off um, fairly early in the game. And so I will start with just a brief overview of our business, just so you have context as to what we've been doing um, and, and who we are as an industry group and as a business. And then I'll pass over to, to my lovely colleague Josie, who would run you through some more specifics of how um, you, know, you can increase diversity at your startup level. And she will share some interesting um, case, cases and, and, and examples. And then I would still be on at the end to take on any uh, specific uh, questions that you would post to either one of us. So, we're from the Disruptive Technologies and Funds Group, and, and our acronym is CDF. I'm still not sure why the CDNF, but that, that's what we're called. And we're a global industry group, um, and we focus on equity investments only. And, and in that team, across nine locations, because we look at the entirety of emerging markets, as with the IFC business, um, we're scattered all over in, in, in nine locations so we can have good geographical spread. And, and in doing so, it's about 70 people doing that. And our equity investments are both um, on the fund side um, into larger growth funds and on the equity side into early stage capital, where we're looking at um, seed and, and, and pre-seed through funds or in a direct business, looking at more series A, series B type investment. And in some cases, I think we've done series C and D as well. And we've been in, in emerging markets for a very long time, um, 30 years uh, plus per count, um, where we ma made our first fund investment. And then as you know, the world evolved and technology became cutting edge, uh, we set up a dedicated venture asset class practice in 2010. Um, and that's building off the work we have done in emerging markets over the past, over the previous decades, and realizing that technology is at the forefront, the thinking was we need to set a dedicated business to be able to address some of the emerging market challenges that we know using the tools that we've already deployed on ground and then applying and, and understanding what the venture ecosystem is there to be able to make meaningful impact. And of course, as we're doing that through our disruptive technologies and digital agenda, looking at the digital economy, in various sectors, uh, where it, whether it's access to healthcare, education, transport, logistics, or financial inclusion, 
where we really have um, a role to play in, in using technology to address some of the critical development needs through these sectors. And, and we looking at that, it's apparent that there is gender issues across board. You know, if you're kicking off and trying to be innovative, it is critical at the forefront to embed gender early, which is why I like what Marcella said. If we're going to be at the cutting edge of changing the digital economy and looking at some of these disruptive techs in emerging markets as an industry leader, we better get gender in there right and we get better get it in there early, which is what has prompted our gender diversity work across um, our direct investments in these disruptive tech companies, as well as through our fund investments. So I'll pass it over to Josie now. Uh, she would engage you in some interesting questions to kick off to stimulate the thinking around it, and we'll take any questions at the end. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Steph. Can everyone hear me OK? Just Steph, if you can give me a thumbs up, that would be great. Awesome. Well, it's a pleasure to be here um, virtually with you all and thank you all for joining in the conversation and uh, Marcella and Steph, thank you so much um, for what you've said so far. So my first question and I'm hoping that the slides are going to update. I did just press next. It's going a bit slowly, but whilst it's kicking off, uh, my question to you is, have you been supported by any female finances or female led funds? So if you could please reply in the chat, that would be great. I can't actually see the chat. So <laughs> um, Steph, maybe you can let me know what you can see because I'm, I'm seeing the, the shared screen format. Have we had any answers to that? Not yet, but I would hazard a guess that looking at the low rates of female uh, PVC fund, uh, you know, fund managers in, in, in emerging markets, there might be a few, not too many, because we have the data and the numbers, and so I'm sure it reflects in market reality as well. Yeah, we are 8% of women ahead of venture capital funds only across the globe, so. Exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. So then the next question is, does your company have any gender policies in place? So things that Marcella talked about, things like flexi work, parental leave, anti-harassment policies. And I really do encourage you to be interactive. It would be great to hear from live on the ground interactions. If we were in a room, I'd be uh, I'd be calling someone out, but I can't see you, so so please do get involved. Okay, um, I'm just going to trust that uh, there are some replies coming in. And so the next question, and I guess even if you're not replying, I guess maybe think about where I'm going with this and and why. Um, so what percentage of your current teams have female employees? Is it less than 20% of staff that are women, 20 to 50%, 50 to 100%? Great, and then the next question is, have you thought about whether your products and services could better support women? So Steph, I'm gonna call on you again. Have there been any answers coming through? Not yet, but I, I trust the audience would have thought about their products and services supporting women uh, just because if they're on here, they are, you know, thinking somewhat about it. Um, yeah. OK, brilliant. I, I agree with that. OK, so I hope that the next slide is showing. Um, this is just to highlight the number of technology companies with gender lens commitments. Um, so as you can see, looking at this slide, there are some really uh, big names out there. So the likes of Facebook, Dell, Twitter, Facebook, I think I've said twice because there's a logo on there twice, um, and Google. And yeah, this is just really to highlight that this is a movement that has been long overdue and it's starting to really kick off. It's sort of started to, to come in around the mid 2010s so to 2015s. Um, but more and more in the last in the last of six, seven years, um, more and more technology companies in particular are making commitments and setting setting commitments against targets. So 
throughout this presentation, by the way, the format's going to be, I'm going to be showing you some information and then I'm going to be trying to unlock some of that with examples of real life case studies of where companies have used either, well, mainly we're focusing on gender here, but who've incorporated diversity into their business models and actually how it's had positive returns, whether it be engagement with their staff and or their customers. And also, I think it's important to say that everything we're covering today, whilst hopefully it would shed some light and give clarity, stimulate some ideas, this is not at all an exhaustive list. So if also you have any questions, please bring them to the table at the end of the Q&A session. So as Marcella said, as Steph said, it's, it's very clear to us, I mean, it seems quite obvious that companies that achieve gender equality are much more likely to outperform their competitors. This could be developing higher innovation, having a variety of different perspectives and problem solving, increasing creativity, faster problem solving, sometimes leading to better, or often always really leading to better decision making, increasing the profits, as Marcella highlighted um, a few times, and having higher employee engagement also, crucially, reducing employee turnover, which, as you guys know, as you're um, as you're at the, sort of the beginning of your your companies, having turnover is something that can really impact startovers, uh, sorry, startups at the beginning. So rather than having to start over, it's really key to develop an inclusive culture, to meet your customers' needs, and also to achieve those ESGs. So I'm going to ask you another question, which is similar to one we've asked before. Have you hired female employees? And if you could let us know how many of this is, this would be great. So I hope we're on to the next slide. I, I don't know if we're playing a bit of catch up, but right now I'd love to chat to you about the in-market gender interventions that technology companies can implement. So we're going to look really at three different areas. So firstly, we're going to look at how can you include diversity and gender from the employee, the workforce level, then at the senior management, and then also from and throughout the value chain. So as you can see, Again, as I've said before, this is not at all an exhaustive list, but this on the screen are some indicators of where you as your companies can start to implement diversity and gender equality. So whether that be in the case of recruiting, actually taking out um, unconscious bias, this could even be from the get go when you're putting the job advert out to when you're actually hiring. Um, and I think one one example that always comes to mind whenever I see this about recruitment is about 10 years ago, I was um, I was doing a job application and it was actually quite the norm to put in a photo. Now, I think one of the great things is that of today is that people are really trying to take out any biases like that so that people who are hired are hired on their merit. Ensuring that there's equal pay by conducting uh, recurring uh, pay audits and really trying to close this gender gap is really, really key. Um, and also not just in pay, but also what are the sort of equitable benefits? Advocating for flexible work provisions, including child care support. Now, in some cases, this might not be feasible, particularly for SMEs, but it can be something that you can take into account in terms of having flexible work. So, for example, could it be that um, you've hired someone who's a parent who actually needs to leave at a certain time to pick up their child and then sort of understanding that they'll be online later and pick up the work then? So having having a really clear conversation with uh, with your employees is really, really key. Also establishing effective mechanisms, including policies and programs to just really ensure that there's no harassment um, in the workplace and so making, making that known um, from the beginning. In terms of recruitment, also we've touched on that a bit little earlier, but really trying to ensure that you've got a 50-50 
um, equal mix. So some companies that have really taken to um, incorporating unbiased uh, recruitment, for example, is Talent Sona, who've actually done blind resume screening. And then in terms of ensuring um, equal pay, we'll talk about this a bit later, but Salesforce and Google are just two examples of tech companies who've really tried to tackle this problem head on publicly and, um, and in an effective way. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is talking about the leadership. And again, similarly with hiring with your employees at a junior level, it's really, really key to hire senior female talent. Um, so as, as Marcella said, you know, bringing the change from the top as much as it is from, from the bottom. And not just actually in terms of the, you know, the sort of employees that you have in the company, but also the board members, they they have a huge impact on the strategy as well. So ensuring that you have at least 50 50 um, in terms of gender ratio. Again, in terms of equal pay, really ensuring that top talent are remunerated for what they bring to the table and ensuring that there isn't a pay gap and things that are not disproportionate. And again, in terms of the senior leadership, being really public and open and transparent and trying to include data. I'll say it again, if there were some things that I'd love for you to take away from this presentation, it's data and targets and transparency. If you know where you're at in your company, then you can really bring about change and start to, to implement, implement um, a change in the direction. Now, before we go on to the, the next level, I'd love to know, have you thought about gender diversity already within your own network of service providers and suppliers? And if so, how? So as we've touched on, there are several ways that technology companies can pursue diversity and equality. And a very key one is the value chain um, especially the supply chain and the customers, um, and are you really addressing their needs? So there's been a lot of research on the fact that incorporating product testing really can in some cases save lives, whether it be, um, you know, there's a very famous example of airbags um, that beforehand would be tested on um, on on men and not on, on, on men dummies and not female dummies um, and that unfortunately had really catastrophic impact so um, regardless of what your product is it's really knowing from the beginning like is the service that you're providing is it really specific to your audience so the other thing again is your distribution network Marcella also talked about that like thinking about um, who you are distributing and selling your products. So, you know, Marcella said, don't necessarily go for the biggest, um, the biggest partner. I would actually say, like, yes, I'm building on from that. Well, what about if you are, say, working with a big partner? Are they also doing things to bring more women into the equation or um, diverse employees? So, in the case of the IFC, we've actually highlighted. Um, some examples of how some of our um, ride hailing apps that we have, you know, things, um, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, I'm not quite sure what you have in the local uh, Brazilian market, but to use Bolt, for example, it was previously Taxify. Um, they're really doing training on um, their, their female drivers. So um, really trying to increase it from all angles. So safety for women and also um, giving more women jobs as well. So I'm just going to take a little sip of water. A very key thing is also implementing policies and standards. So particularly in the supply chain, it's all very well and good to have you know, an anti-harassment policy on your own company, but you really got to think about who are you engaging with and do their policies and standards match up to yours too? Um, you know, we could 
take examples in this from the fashion industry or I've already highlighted the automotive industry, but really think about that getting down into um, into the nitty gritty of who are you working with? And that's not just for brand image. It's really for what is your company and what is the purpose behind it? Another key thing is also building on industry alliances and support communities, and this can actually really add to your favour in terms of policies and standards. So are there, for example, women led producer networks that you could be working with or are there trade member organisations that, let's be honest, have done a lot of the hard work for you already, ensuring that they have a whole host of partners that you could sort of tap into. So there are so many ways to, to sort of to tackle this. And, and I think forming um, alliances and support communities can can really be um, a very effective and efficient way in order to to grow from a business development perspective and knowledge angle. And also to really ensure that I guess you're doing uh, the best um, and the most current um, at the time of, um, of of the product you're putting out there. And also it can also be a great marketing opportunity for you. You could yourself end up being a case study for one of these alliances, just as a for instance, and you might find it's not just you pushing sales, um, but people coming to you as well. And again, it's really focusing on data as well. So collecting that um, dis sex disaggregated de uh, data. So some of the alliances just to highlight that could be interesting if you are, for example, in the tech space is the Responsible Business Alliance, um, which makes sure that an electronic supply chain practices are, are more ethical. They have over 110 companies um, already committed, just to name a few, Amazon, Ericsson, Microsoft, even Tesla, Samsung and Xerox. From an IFC perspective, um, a couple of case studies that you, uh, you know, feel free to, to look up are also um, our work with Trade Depot in Nigeria and Max AB in Egypt that are particularly working to try and increase female distributors and networks. And also, I think it's key to really think about the customer here. So when you're rolling out your product designs to really keep gender in mind, So I said I'd go d deep into a couple more companies. So I think we've got a bit of time for this. We've just got a, about two or three to, to really delve in before we go on to our Q&A. Um, so Salesforce is a company who've really been trying to address um, their, uh, their gender equality and diversity. So um, they, to such an extent that the CEO has actually spoken out publicly about it and it's something that they do every year. Um, they've really tried to, to take on um, constructive feedback in terms of not, not having biases. Um, another area that they've really, really um, made, um, made a huge effort in is ensuring that staff salaries are equal. Um, and they've done this by having company wide audits. They've actually even <laughs> when they've done the audit and they found that there is a salary, um, a salary gap, they've actually compensated um, and made adjustments up to three million. These these figures um, are for a year or so ago, but it's still it's still key to note. And I guess one way to mitigate this is even from the beginning is, is is and why we're highlighting it and why Marcella and Steph said it it's starting early starting now ensuring that you don't have to go back and adjust those salaries but but implementing um, that at the get-go they've also devised a new set of job codes and standards and I think one thing which um, tech companies have had to do um, is to in in the cases where they've needed to play um, potentially catch up is to employ a chief equality officer to really ensure that uh, this mission of trying to close the gap is um, is achieved. So that's something you could think about, whether that be having um, one dedicated person for that 
or setting up an employee resource group and sharing the responsibility. I guess it depends on the size of your organization, um, but it's definitely something to, to think about and to be working with HR um, from the beginning. One of our very own IFC case studies um, and one which we're um, immensely proud of is Mercado Libra, um, who've really, really, um, as you can see from this list, they've taken uh, they've taken the gender commitments really seriously, whether it be that they've um, encouraged staff to actually go beyond their jobs and to take extra learning courses. They're a very entrepreneurial um, organization and initially they thought um, that actually employees would just choose courses themselves but they've actually put in a structure um, so rather than just sort of leaving employees to work it out on themselves they're encouraging uh, and sponsoring employees to take MBAs, master's courses, language courses and really trying to be um, to be in tune with uh, what their employees are are wanting um, to learn and a fantastic figure is actually that on average about 35 percent of women employees have engaged with this a key thing again is recruitment like really really trying to have unconscious bias um, from the beginning of um, hiring talent and similarly at a senior level um, having control exercises and ensuring that there are at least two women candidates for every man that is shortlisted. In terms of mentoring and coaching, this is one thing which um, really, really need to highlight is, um, is actually providing opportunities and that can be peer to peer mentoring. It could be having it in a formal way and having coaching, but um, Mercado Libra have um, successfully implemented that. Um, another thing is actually having FaceTime with senior executives. I'm sure I don't need to tell you you're running companies yourself. FaceTime and having meetings can sometimes seem like it's just another thing to do, but actually Mercado Libra is an example of how actually formalizing and having some um, not so formal chats has really, really led to increased employee engagement and encouraging employees to, to feel part of the organization. So whether that be implementing an ad hoc informal breakfast or whether it is live streaming a conversation um, with the CEO, um, it's sort of up to you how you do it. But I think having a human face behind senior management and, and having accessibility um, is, is, is key. Um, I was going to use the example of having an open door policy, but I mean, it's kind of hard, I guess, in the time of COVID. I, I don't know how all of your companies are, are set up, um, but whether that could that open door could could look like having, um, I don't know, an hour a week where or an hour a month where the senior manager is just online on Teams and you can have an informal water cooler break or coffee chat. Um, but then also, I think having um, having the option for those private conversations too. A very, very key thing is also um, integrating or, or, or ensuring that um, that employees feel like the policies are actually reflective of what they what they need and representing them. So in the case of Mercado Libre, they were um, one of the first Latin America companies to offer egg preservation as a benefit. And um, that that's been since um, 2018. Um, in addition to that, actually giving women uh, longer, well, I think it's 30 days, if I can read my deck correctly, of, of extra paid maternity leave um, above the mandated 90 days. And also recognising that fathers too um, uh, should be entitled to more leave as well with 15 days. And also giving more flexible options. I think one of the key things is, is really working with your employee to ensure that they have a good setup to do uh, to do the job and to do the work. Um, another key thing is also having internal job postings. So when you've hired talent, retaining them, 
again, this goes on to the mentoring and coaching um, and the learning, but uh, even think about when you are putting out an internal job um, advertisement, what is the language you're putting out there? Are you using language that might actually um, be more appealing to a man than a woman? Um, are there, you know, are there, um, is, you know, would it be a good idea to actually have blind work samples so you can actually test and see, you know, is that person's um, work up to standard um, for that job before they get to interview? And then the last case study that we're going to look into, because I do want to have some time for Q&A, is Google. Um, and you can see from, um, from this uh, presentation deck that, um, and I've, I've mentioned it earlier, um, is that Google have really tried hard to address the issue of um, the pay. Um, and uh, they've been running a very rigorous um, analysis based on stats to ensure that not only um, salaries, but also bonuses and equity are fair across the board. They've really looked um, across the diversity spectrum. So yes, they've created employee resources groups such as, as women at Groupon, uh, sorry, not Groupon, excuse me, women um, at Google. I used to work at Groupon, so it just rolls off the tongue, excuse me for that. Um, but also, you know, I'm just looking here and there are at least um, 20 or more different employee resource groups such as Black Googlers Network, Google Africans Disability Alliance, um, Google Veterans Network, um, Interbelief Network. Obviously, Google is at a huge stage um, with more than 100,000 employees in over 170 cities across 60 countries. I, I realise that they're going to need a lot of employee resources groups, but I guess the, the key message is um, really what can you do for your own organization? Is that something you've, you've, you've thought about? Um, and having, um, having been part of setting up an employee resource group myself and, and also um, seeing them in other organizations, I can say it really can help with that to borrow one of the, or two of the words on, on the page there, sort of a culture add. So what is it that your employees can, can really bring? So, We've now got about, I think, 15, 12 minutes um, where we'd love to chat and we'd love to hear any questions or answers that you have. So thanks very much. Let me just pull up the, um, hang on one second, just the Q&A slide, stand by. Oops, there we go. All right. So we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, so I guess I will ask this question first to all of you. What is the first step to ensure diversity? Should we start internally or by choosing partners with this priority externally? Um, is, did somebody want to maybe take that? Yeah, I can kick off and, yeah. and I love that um, someone's thinking about best approach. Um, it's there is no one approach that is right or how to kick off. But in, in my experience, what I've seen is it's very encouraging when when startups and, and companies start internally because you build that DNA into your policy, you build it into the framework of your company and then it almost forces an external partner coming in to align with your mandate because what we have seen with the other approach it's great to have external partners coming in and quote and unquote push gender diversity for you and typically when that happens especially for startups it's either an lp or, or there sorry if it's for startups it's your financier or someone on your cap table who ideally maybe giving you the largest check, saying this check comes with this contingent of diversity. It doesn't always work. Why? Because it's it's a stick or a carrot, depending on how you look at it, but it's not sustainable. And so preference, it's, it's nice when it's a coordinated effort, but I think starting internally 
to push that diversity mandate for yourself as a business is, a, is the best way to kick off. Um, I would also, I'll pause there and see if there is, there's any more that um, Marcella or Josie want to add on to that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Steph said. I think um, what you, you know, what you what you reap, you sow, or what you sow, you reap. Um, yeah, and I think that yes, the partnerships is key. But if you have your values aligned, you know, it's like in your own life. If you have your values aligned and you know what um, is going to be good for you, then and your business, then then the rest will follow and also having that clarity at the beginning and implementing it into your strategy um, mm -hmm. will not only have a higher ROI for you, but I think it can also um, lead to more satisfactory employee engagement, um, which, you know, it's just a knock on domino effect. You get it wrong. It's a disaster. You get it right. It's not it's not easy. Um, you can't kid yourself, but it, it really helps and it, it makes um, the process of growing your business a lot a lot um, easier I'd say a quicker. Yes I completely agree with what both of you said and I, I actually remembered something that we discussed earlier um, being or working with developing countries we usually get a lot of I don't have money to become ESG. I, I don't have enough time to try to do this. I need to focus on sales. I need to focus on breaking even. I need to, you know, break the surface and breathe outside the water. And that's not entirely true, right? As we saw today, at the earliest level um, or a little bit later on, whenever it is that you do start, you can already make a huge difference and sometimes with very little effort. It's a matter of having the correct mindset, not a correct or incorrect, but having the mindset to do it and implementing it um, sometimes doesn't even require that much time or investment. It's it's really a matter of being aligned with those values and, and making the effort um, to translate that into the company. And just also to add on to that, I think we've also highlighted this through our conversation, but um, that also will have an impact on the product that you're, you're, you're developing and the services you're providing, because uh, the more diverse your team is, just by definition, the more customers you are representing as well and hopefully um, serving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So the next question is uh, directed at the IFC team. Um, how exactly can tech startups push diversity in the supply chain? Um, and they went on to say, unfortunately, not all companies disclose gender KPIs. Do you have any tips on that? Oh, man, this this question. <laughs> uh, it, because we had this exact um, challenge um, when, as Josie highlighted, we've done two uh, projects with with two companies, Trade Depot and and in Nigeria and Max Max AB, which is a platform uh, which addresses. So it's a platform for ordering um, through FMCG from FMCG companies, trying to get directly to to sort of mom and pop shops, and and trying to sort of look at diversity through our work in their value chain. And you're spot on. Uh, most of the companies would not provide uh, their data on it. And I think this is where, to an extent, having external partners comes in or partnering with some larger companies that have the mandate to give that push a little bit uh, for, for, for companies that are a little bit smaller to help out. Um, it also starts with you and your own selection, right? And you know who you're sourcing from, you know who your providers are, et cetera. And so having that closer relationship with them, not necessarily trying to get fine data to the end, but you visiting their premises, you sort of engaging them closer, you get a feel for the gender dynamics at their end and in their room without access to hardcore data. And then having those conversations, if they realize you as their customer, um, is is interested in this, it will prompt certain conversations and gradually move that there. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dance and an art with this one versus a more scientific. This is what I stand for. 
um, I need your numbers. Because also, I'll, I'll say this and I say this cautiously, it's emerging markets play. And so to an extent, you have to do this, you have to be patient in addressing some of these things where you don't have full control, but also doing it with uh, a dedication and a commitment to still get to your goal. And if I could add to that, um, it's sort of doing doing your due diligence as, as Steph is highlighting, um, but also, um, you know, going on the ground, meeting them, knowing your partners, knowing what they stand for, knowing knowing the values. Um, and again, to lend on what Marcella was saying, maybe don't just go for what seems like the low hanging fruit. If you're if you're building a company that you're wanting to grow to scale, um, then it's important that you are you're happy with all elements of it. And I, I totally appreciate this might not always be possible, but that's also why we highlighted um, you're building the community or joining alliances or um, you know having conversations um, with people who are already in the field and on the ground. Um, these, you know, it, the world can be a huge place, but it can also be a very small space. And um, you know, rumors um, it, get around if 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 there's a business that's not behaving ethically or, or for whatever reason. So just be in tune to that. Ask the diligent questions and think to yourself, okay, maybe doing a bit more time now is 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 you know seems like a lot of work, but it will pay off in the long run. Awesome, thank you. So let's move on to the next question. Thank you so much, um, Josie and Stephanie, on, on answering that question. How does we venture integrate to ESG and more specifically gender lens with the financial returns when analyzing a potential investment? But this is for Marcella. Good, thank you. Thanks for this question. I'll actually combine it with the next one. We are currently learning from the experts so we we have lots of conversations with IFC um, to create this um, framework for um, gender lens investing analysis and integrating it into our analysis and then translating that into um, KPIs and metrics to be followed so basically what the the general framework would be to try to understand how in our case how the proposed company aligns with the um, UN SDGs with which we ventures is aligned as a fund. So that's what we analyze and then that's what we try to monitor um, in the day after the investment as well. Um, there's another question for me as well, so I'll just tackle the, thir the third one in a row and then we can go back to the girls. Um, if this material will be available on the We Ventures website, we are at, our website is actually under construction and I promise it will launch sometime this year. We have just a, a simple landing page over there. Um, this material, this specific presentation will be available on the, on the Reactor um, YouTube channel. Um, I'm sure Rebecca will share the link later on for this. Um, and the, the playbook that I mentioned that was put together by We Impact is available at their website for download. I'm not sure if they have it in English, but they definitely do have it in Portuguese. It's weimpact.tech. It's over there. You can download it for yourself and, and have a look at the recommendations. Rebecca, I think you're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> I double clicked it. I appreciate uh, you helping me out there. <laughs> so um, I think we are at time, so I will quickly just um, step over and put up for the upcoming events. But before that, I just wanted to once again say thank you, Josie, Stephanie, Marcella. This was fantastic. You covered a lot of great material. I think the topics that were reviewed are extremely important, you know, especially today and age um, in our workplace and, and making sure that we're accommodating and being more aware of, you know, everybody and their needs um, in the workplace because it's not anything what it used to be. And, the world's always changing, so we have to change with it, you know. Um, but which brings me to 
the next segment of this session, um, how to do business with corporate buyers. So uh, this is the next part of the series on August 18th. This session will also be in English. Um, if you're available, if you're interested, this is the next part of the series. I've dropped the link to the series chat. Um, I'm the series link into the chat, excuse me. Um, so if you are tuning in for the first time, this is an ongoing series. Um, there's been a lot of great sessions in the past. They are available on our calendar, on demand, on our YouTube channel. I've shared those links with you. Um, do check them out. Feel free to drop any questions um, to us on our sites, um, and we will certainly try to get those questions answered if you, you know, weren't able to ask them on the session itself. Um, we also have a session in September, on September 1st. Uh, this session will be in Portuguese. Again, all of our sessions have closed captioning in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So if you're tuning in from uh, somewhere in the world where one language is better than another, do know that even if we're speaking in a specific language, um, it is available, closed captions and alternative. So you can still tune in, follow along, get some great takeaways from that. Um, and this is all part of our reactor program. So if you're not familiar, if you've heard about this event or this series um, from another channel or, or through word of mouth, do you know that um, the Microsoft reactor program is always running great contact content focused primarily on developers and startups. Uh, we have a regular run of content and updating a forever growing calendar of events. Do check out um, our main website, reactor, microsoftreactor.com. You can also visit us on our YouTube channel, as previously mentioned, for any past content that may have been covered that you might be interested in. We have a newsletter. You can find us on Twitter. Um, and we're also on Meetup regionally um, for our physical locations, which there are. 11 around the world, um, but don't let that hold you back. You know, depending on what time works for you, there might be sessions in alternative time zones that you might find available. Um, yeah, so that is my end of it. I will open the floor up to our speakers once again, just for a final word if they'd like. Um, if anyone wanted to say goodbye or um, any final comments on on what was covered today? You're more than welcome to at this time. Sure. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, IFC, for sharing this amazing content. We are huge fans, and I always like to finish off with a call. Be vocal, ladies. Let's let's join. Um, let's try to be active and vocal on our cause. Let's get together and do it. Thank you very much. You go, Josie. Um, go for it. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say it's been an absolute pleasure and um, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Just remember data targets, data helps drive decision making and recruitment as well. Um, but looking forward hopefully to connecting with any of you after this. But thanks so much uh, to Microsoft and WeVentures for this opportunity. Over to you, Steph. No, you know, final word of thanks and just to encourage everyone to to push on the gender agenda. Um, sometimes it looks tough, uh, but we will get there. Uh, we've made quite a bit of strides in the past couple of years, even though COVID has had an impact in in rolling back some of the progress that has been made uh, globally. But you guys are on the ground and doing, you know, your part in pushing it. So please. Let's all collectively move forward in doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Take, take care until the next one. Thanks. Bye.